Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Heather Yost, and welcome to the Take Your Life Back Summit. We're really doing this summit because we want to help people feel hope, find answers, and ultimately start healing. We're exploring 21 different experts' roadmaps out of chronic pain, autoimmune disorders, and fatigue. And today, we are blessed to have Dr. Bradley Bush here. I'll tell you a little bit more about Dr. Bush. He received his naturopathic doctor degree from National College of Naturopathic um, medicine. He really focuses on fatigue, autoimmune disorders, insomnia, GI disorders, mood disorders, and Lyme disease. You, you have 15 plus years of experience. Is that correct, Dr. Bush? That's correct, Heather. That's awesome. And you really go after natural solutions as well as um, various laboratory testing in the industry. You speak nationally too, correct? That's correct. That's awesome. And um, our regularly published author. You live in Stillwater, Minnesota. You've got four daughters, and your wife is also a naturopathic doctor, correct? That's correct. That's awesome. Well, welcome. We're so blessed to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, putting this sum together. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate you saying that. Before we sort of dive into what you do, I always ask everybody, I want to know, how did you get to where you are? Professionally, everything. What's your story? Well, you know, I, I, I was a I guess a young geek growing up, uh, love science, love, uh, love medicine, love plants. And uh, my passions kind of steered me in one direction. I uh, went, to, went to undergraduate school for, uh, uh, for, for zoology and chemistry. Wanted to be a researcher. I wanted to, to watch animals and do things. So what did that end up to, uh, doing? Well, ended up go doing some missionary work in Haiti uh, f uh, in between uh, graduate school. Uh, undergrad and graduate school. And at that point, I realized, well, you know what? I don't know if this world needed another researcher in a windowless room. Uh, I just needed to heal people or help people. So in my, I went to back to my uh, local library in the south side of Chicago and looked up uh, different medicines. I actually was looking at uh, acupuncture and chiropractic schools on the West Coast, and I dropped the book, and it opened up to naturopathic medicine. And I never even heard of naturopathic medicine up until that point. So I made some phone calls, and I said, hey, this is right up my alley. I was all pre-med already. Uh, I just didn't want to be into the conventional medical model. Uh, so I ended up, I packed my bags, and I moved over to Portland, Oregon, where I ended up uh, spending six years there, four years in school, uh, and then eventually uh, graduated. I moved with my uh, soon-to-be wife to the East Coast. We set up shop and practice for eight years in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. And uh, then, uh, you know, after we had you know, many kids, you know, we just kept replicating. Uh, <laughs> and we decided that the East Coast was not our flavor. Uh, nothing against the East Coast, just wasn't our flavor. And we ended up moving back to the Midwest where I had an opportunity to be an executive at a laboratory uh, company. And it was a research lab, com uh, commercial lab, and nutritional supplement solutions company uh, for neurological and immunological issues. So I ended up working there for seven years, setting up shop here in Stillwater, Minnesota. So now I started living, living the dream. I, I work two blocks from my house, so I unicycle to work on the nice days. My kids go to school right behind my house. They can walk right over to the clinic if necessary. Uh, and here we offer uh, a lot of things that are just not commonly offered in the Midwest uh, and, it, and sometimes in part, many parts of the, the country. So I think, um, I think actually the video skipped out a little bit. I thought I heard you say you unicycle to work. Yeah, you know. <laughs> You know, it's one of those things you, you I, I, did, I didn't, I haven't, know, I didn't know how to unicycle, but my oldest <laughs> daughter wanted to learn. And so we, we, we challenged each other and I just wanted to say to people, yeah, I unicycle to work. Um, I so I could unicycle with a cup of coffee uh, and my backpack to work, which so it's. How old were you when you first learned this then? I was 44. That is awesome. Yeah. yeah. That is, so you're like the unicycle doctor. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. I think being close to work must be really, really cool, especially with kids. Mm -hmm. So you said you offer a lot of things in your practice that are different than other doctors. What makes you different or what makes your clinic as a whole unique? 
Well, you know, I, I, like to, I, like, I don't want to think that I'm totally unique. I think we just incorporate a lot of things. Uh, I tell patients at the end of the day, you know, we're, very, we're, we're science minded and we practice holistic medicine, but we don't practice based on a hope and a prayer. Or as a patient once told me, you know, we sought you out because we're sick of chasing rainbows. Uh, we look at analytical data uh, and we use both conventional uh, labs, we use alternative labs, we integrate the information along with how people have responded to treatments in the past, to their genetic uh, predispositions and, uh, uh, and, and what their symptoms uh, are uh, and their physical exams. So we assimilate all that information and then create uh, roadmaps about, hey, you know, this is where we think we need to go. I never tell a patient you have to do this because guess what? There's usually many different ways to get a, to a destination. Uh, and so we work with people and what their beliefs are. Sometimes we try to steer them in a way uh, to be efficient and effective. Uh, other times people, you know, uh, they have their own uh, desires and things that they need to rule out as part of their healing process. And we're fine with that also. Uh, so ultimately, you know, what I uh, made a, a, a good career with has been especially neuroimmunology, looking at how the nervous system is functioning uh, and how it's functioning in correlation with the immune system and then integrating that into strategies. And so we get a lot of people, of course, a lot of the chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, a lot of the patients who uh, have chronic Lyme, who think they have chronic Lyme or mold exposure or you name it, just the people that are, that are all these head scratchers that, you know, they're the, they're the round peg trying to get into a square hole in the conventional world. And they just end up chasing their tail around and they're being told that they have to go for psyche valves because there's nothing left. Um, and so we get a lot of these patients. We also get a lot of people who have gone through heck in a handbasket and they've come out the other end, but now they're sort of little damaged goods. I mean, they are on a bunch of meds. They don't feel really well. Uh, and now they just need to reboot the system and then get off of things. And when it comes to a lot of the psychiatric medications, the antidepressants, uh, the anxiolytics, the sleep aids, uh, we do really well with that uh, because we could help in making those medications work better and then help titrate. And if necessary, our prescriber on staff allows us to uh, swap out certain medications or use a local compounding pharmacy to create liquid versions of certain uh, medications to help ease the titration because at the end of the day, most of the time, people are just told, oh, yeah, just go off of it. You just can't go off certain meds if you've been on them for years and years. You're set up for failure. But if you identify what your needs are and why that medication has helped or has altered uh, your chemistry, then you can provide a bridge for them, uh, a mm -hmm. little crutch to get them through that harder, more difficult portion of the withdrawal. And then to, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, have better balance. And here at our clinic, you know, we're, we're holistic, we're natural based, but we will do whatever it takes for the patient. We, so we, we tell people we have no dogma. Uh, if we think that a different practitioner or even a conventional approach is best, we'll tell you and we'll tell you why. At the same token, we'll use our herbs, our botanicals, we use IV therapies, we'll use prescriptions, we'll use uh, diet, we'll use nutrition, whatever it takes to get you where you want to go. But at the end of the day, we tell them it all starts with diagnostics first. We need to know what is wrong because, you know, Throwing treatments uh, is like, uh, at someone without a good diagnosis is like throwing a dart in the middle of the night. It's, it's a hope and a prayer. So we, we, we be, try to become a, as laser focused as possible. And of course, that then leads to the maximum uh, outcomes, uh, the maximum possible outcome for the patient. Beautifully said. I think to sum it up, you're really not an alternative doctor. You're a complementary doctor that you look at the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. just... Yeah, I would say, you know, exactly. Um, we're, I, I'm being described a lot of times in my area as sort of the in-between. It's like, you know, it's very medical, but yet it's open-minded and holistic. <laughs> and we can, you, they can get alternative medicine here. They can get primary uh, medicine to some degree here. We don't like to do primary medicine. We like to try and get people into, of course, off of medications if possible, 
and even off supplements if possible. I tell people at the end of the day, our goal is to have your discretionary income go to high quality food and vacations because if that will keep you healthy and happy for your whole life. I agree very much. I love how you said that you're sort of, you help people bridge from where, you know, you're sort of saying that you help them, you're the bridge between where they were and where they want to go. Yeah, where they are and where they ab go. absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of practitioners out there doing things I will never do. And we don't do energy work or anything like that. It's not that, uh, it's not that I, I don't believe in it. Uh, it just doesn't have the science that I would do in my little comfort zone or in my niche of what I'm good at. But we help people find those people or help people who are really solidly in that camp where they're, they, they, they've been damaged with the conventional medical model so much that they don't even want to deal with the doctors anymore. Well, mm -hmm. I tell people at the end of the day, well, that's not good overall. You just can't throw out one whole thing. There's, there's times and places for everything. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, uh, I tell my good friends that are uh, uh, strong homeopaths, at the end of the day, if you get in a motor vehicle accident and you're on the inside of the road, a homeopathic's not going to help you that much at that point. So you've got to go into a, the, the conventional medical model for emergency medicine. Likewise, uh, there's many diagnostic tests that are critical uh, to rule out. I mean, at, at a certain age and certain issues, I mean, we here at our clinic, we, do, uh, we have a, a laboratory that also runs uh, uh, breath tests and analysis. So we, we're one of four clinics in the state of Minnesota that has a Quintron breath analyzer. And we run lactulose and glucose breath tests uh, to rule out small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. We do that because it's a conventional gastroenterology definition and diagnosis, but it's rarely ever done in gastroenterology. Uh, and so we offer that service because most of the time, if you wanted that service, you'd have to get scoped up and down and have, you know, $12,000 thrown against your deductible before they even uh, entertain the idea of maybe running a lactulose breath test, which is horrible because that's a very inexpensive test uh, that you could run and you get great data that ends up being a root cause problem to many people's gastroenterology problems. Right, right. On that note of um, that you mentioned just different practitioners and different ways of testing and so on and so forth, I think a lot of people as they listen to different doctors and what they're doing maybe start to think, well, my doctor didn't test that and my doctor should have done this and my doctor. Can you comment on the, fa on the fact that really we're all, all practitioners are sort of doing what they're trained and you're grabbing from so many different models, which is very unique, but an average doctor doesn't know that type of information. They're doing what they're trained. Can you comment mm -hmm. on if you've seen that or... Oh, absolutely. I have to, I have to, I have to kind of counsel patients a lot of times right. because we'll, we'll, we'll test people and we'll use a specialty lab to identify a, uh, the, the dysbiosis within sinus cavities, which was the root cause behind their chronic sinusitis for 15, 20 years and, or their gastrointestinal problem because of a dysbiosis in their small intestine. We did that because, well, we're aware of that test and people who don't get well through all these different parts of the healthcare uh, cycle come to us eventually. Well, just because we did it doesn't mean someone had to have and that they're derelict in their duty. Uh, everybody has a, has a role to play. And, you know, honestly, if you go and if you get your uh, uh, med medicine from a uh, conventional medical model with insurance base, you have to follow by the insurance rules. There's a playbook. And, it's, yes. it's, and that playbook is designed for helping the, mass, the massive population to stay as uh, uh, alive as possible <laughs> at the lowest possible price in a very efficient model. Now, is it efficient for everybody? No, it's for the vast majority of people. But if you're really sick, we call it the walking wounded. If you're not lying on, the, on your back, if you're walking and don't feel good, that model doesn't always work best for you. Likewise, you go to a, a, if you go to a chiropractor, you know, that chiropractor isn't going to be well-versed in every single possible other diagnostics that might be a, 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 um, used by other practitioners because it might not be within their scope of practice. If you go to an orthopedic surgeon, guess what they're going to offer you? 
they're going to offer surgery. <laughs> right. So I, I mean, you ha so the buyer uh, of healthcare, that's the consumer, the audience that we're talking to has to be aware. What is it that you're getting into? What's, you know, and ask the doctors, you know, what's your specialty? What do you offer and how do you differ and what can you do for me? Ask those questions before you even schedule an appointment because you should be able to get an answer to that and find if that works for you. Absolutely. Really what we all have to be is our own best advocate, ask the right questions, take control of our own health and go after what we're wanting for healthcare. And I think, I, I feel like I hear that a lot that people are mad or upset about their journey towards health and maybe not being where they want to be, but ultimately they didn't even necessarily know the right questions to ask, which is part of the purpose and mission of this summit is to give people hope, you know, and help them find the answers, but ultimately to empower people as well to be their own best advocates and seek out individualized medicine. Just as you said, so many, if you go to a general practitioner, you're going to get a general recommendation. There's nothing wrong with that, but saying if it's not working for you and you're mad about where you were, where you are, or where you're going, it's <laughs> sort of the height of insanity to keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. So it sounds as if your clinic one, one of the main things that you're attempting to do is really branch out the individualized medicine while combining all of the worlds. Am I correct? That's correct. That's correct. I mean, uh, I, I have those days where you get a patient who just has high cholesterol walking in the, in the office is awesome. I mean, it's like, <laughs> really? That's, that's all you got? All right, we can work with that. Um, but it's amazing. Even with that, I mean, many people, you know, they come in, they have hypercholesterolemia and they have family hypercholesterolemia, but no one's ever run a, a full test to know, well, how much is uh, that cholesterol is being contributed, that total cholesterol level? How much is contributed by synthesis in the liver? How much is being, uh, is due to the absorption in the intestines? And are you treating them uh, as well uh, for your condition? And you know, there's genetic testing to look to see if you have the ability to tolerate statin medications. If you don't, you shouldn't be on them. Uh, actually, no one should really be on them. They're, unless you have critically high uh, uh, lipid levels, they're often overused and terrible classification of meds in, in general. But with that much said, uh, you know, the average individual has a lot of unmet needs and oftentimes, uh, when they're given their treatment options, they're given a prescription, and that's, that's the start and end of their treatment. And at the end of the day, uh, the, one of the, what has to happen in this country is to come up with a, uh, a, with a better structure to where we uh, help people from the very beginning. Once you get on the med, there's a strategy to get off the med. And if the med did help, the answer is, the question should be, why is it helping? I mean, if you were put on, if you had some depression, and for maybe a good reason, maybe you had a loss of a job, loss of a loved one, whatever it may be, and you went through a lot of stress, and all of a sudden you have depression, anxiety, insomnia, whatever it may be, well, you get put on an SSRI and you feel better. Now, there's nothing really wrong with that, but at the end of the day, What's the, what, what question was never asked? Okay, if the SSRI helped, why did it help? Were you SSRI deficient? No, you were not SSRI deficient. So you were serotonin deficient and you burnt that serotonin out because of stress. Now, why would you remain on an SSRI medication which inherently will deplete your storage levels of serotonin over time so that if you were low to begin with, you're going to be much lower later on because you're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. And that's not a strategy for long-term health. That's a strategy for dependence long-term, which is what often happens. And so then when someone does try to go off an SSRI, let's say three years later when someone remembers, oh yeah, I did put you on that and you should probably get off of it. You go off of it, you, had ser you have low serotonin. Now you feel worse. It, once again, you're not SSRI deficient your serotonin's low. And there's a lot of reasons why people's serotonin is low, from genetics, uh, to stress, to infection, whatever it may be, but it's not because you're SSRI deficient. <laughs> Which becomes a vicious cycle, and really the answer, the root cause answer was never addressed. Right, and, and, and 
and you know, and, and to give it a fair shake, you know, if someone has a death of a loved one, uh, or they have a divorce, or some other major traumatic event, it is very advantageous to make sure that that person's neurochemistry is supported immediately because it will reduce the fallout, reduce the grief period, and help the person rebound faster. But at the same token, majority of people don't need to be, have meds to do that. You could do it nutritionally, much, much more effectively, and or you can use it in combination. And in combination, you can use precursor amino acids to help make more neurotransmitters or some natural calming things to help relax the body and boost your GABA. And at the same token, as you start wanting to wean down off the medication, you can boost that support up to offset it. And that's a winning strategy to let a person break free from the dependency of the med and to allow their body to retain their normal balance, which is who and what they really are. I like that. Absolutely. Um, not to, I want to branch off that subject just a little bit, but still a lot of overlap. I know that in your office, you see a lot of chronic infection. And I also realize that there's an overlap between chronic infection and autoimmune disorder. Can you elaborate a little bit on how does that work? Well, uh, one, one thing we, well, because we're in Minnesota, uh, we have a lot of Lyme disease patients. Uh, their Lyme disease is, uh, we're in the epicenter and it's rather a, an epidemic in certain areas within our county and our, in our region. So we have a lot of awareness of tick-borne illnesses, whether it be Borrelia, Bigdorfi, Lyme disease, or the co-infections of BCR, Bartonella, Ehrlichia. There are now viruses that uh, uh, have migrated from Iowa up this way. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> where you know, if you get bit by a tick, you might you may become allergic to red meat. Uh, I mean, you name it. We're we're becoming highly aware of the infectious nature of our immediate environment and how it has effects on us. Now, there's a big overlap between infection, whether it be something uh, uh, rather instantly transforming like a, like a Lyme infection, uh, or maybe even a viral infection, or even a gastrointestinal infection, uh, or a sinus infection. These infections lead to massive amounts of immune stimulation. And that immune stimulation oftentimes is the uh, switch that turns on genetic predispositions to autoimmune disease. And, and so many people, they might have been predisposed to an autoimmune disorder with a family history of it uh, in the background. And then all of a sudden they get a Lyme disease. And after they get Lyme disease, now they think they have chronic Lyme maybe, but in all reality, they might not have chronic Lyme. They might have kick-started and activated a predisposition of an autoimmune disorder and now that is slowly rolling out. And with many autoimmune disorders, when they first start, you start feeling them, you start feeling off, and they progressively get worse. But guess what? Oftentimes, they're not measurable in laboratory tests for, could be up to years. Sometimes they do, and it's great because then you have an early diagnosis and you could start wrapping your arms or, uh, around the problem. But many times, it just goes undiagnosed, which then, you know, once again, you're told, oh, nothing's wrong with you. Well, you're telling the people, no, there's something wrong with me. Now, and that, that's where it, it breeds. You know, when someone doesn't know what's wrong with them, it could create in people's heads all these worst case scenarios. And that's just human nature. We, you know, we're worried that there's something really bad happening. And we're sometimes our worst enemy because we just start spiraling out of control. And hence, here at our office, I mean, we see a lot of people with chronic Lyme, uh, a lot of people with acute Lyme disease too. And in that, of all the people that come see us for chronic Lyme, uh, majority of these people have been sick for a while. And one third of them, one third of all those patients, their number one problem happens to be small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And that's a condition uh, called SIBO that they have an overgrowth of bacteria in their small intestines that really doesn't belong there. And it's of a type of bacteria uh, family that ferment carbohydrates. So when they eat different foods, including your gluten and dairy especially, but also other grains and other fruits and vegetables, 
when they eat those foods, those back, that bacteria becomes very active. They create gases that then lead to diarrhea, constipation, heartburn, uh, 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 belching, uh, gas and bloating. But they also create a lot of metabolic waste and that often circulates throughout the whole body and can lead to symptoms that people associate with different infections, uh, whether it be fibromyalgia symptoms, joint, uh, migrating joint pains, headaches, migraines, brain fog, anxiety, insomnia. We've had people who've had catatonic stares, seizures, and all the different neuropathies that people often associate with infection, but really that infection, it was an infection, but it was more of an overgrowth and dysbiosis in this area of the body. And this area of the body in the small intestines is typically 18 to 22 feet down. That's like in the middle of the body. Scopes don't go there. And the byproduct waste is not measurable. It's because it's a gas. So, I mean, now there are tests available uh, uh, which we do offer uh, both at our clinic uh, and also through our online uh, uh, website, uh, www.neurovana.com, which allows you to measure those. And if people have had infections uh, in the past and they've gone through rounds of antibiotics, those antibiotics uh, predispose people to this overgrowth. And if you're using then symptoms to track your in, uh, treatments, those symptoms may be lying, lying, lying to you and to your practitioner because those symptoms you assume is an infection, but it might not be the one you think it is. Uh, and so you end up over treating and improperly treating because obviously each infection has its own uh, approach and need, especially in the case of SIBO, when it's 18 to 22 feet down, it becomes a difficult thing to kind of uh, uh, to eradicate at times. So what you're saying is you could have a symptom that either a mimics another disease process, infection, and so on, or you could have a symptom that might just simply seem like joint pain, like my back hurts all the time. Maybe it came out of nowhere, maybe it came on shortly, but there's some sort of cause that could be something that's not in the joint system, so to speak. It might be in the intestinal system. Well, absolutely. Here's a, here's a couple of examples. Um, here's one example was a 32 year old female. Uh, she came to see me. She had chronic uh, constipation her entire uh, life, acne when she was younger. And uh, she came to see me. She had the, the burning feet. She had electrical charges running down her legs. And she would go into these catatonic stairs where she would lose basically the ability to move but she can still process and see what's happening around her. And those episodes would last between two minutes and nine minutes at a time, which was freaking her and her family out. So they all thought that she had chronic Lyme disease. She has never remember being bit. Uh, and, you know, and honestly, if she would have gone to most any other clinic, they probably would have been happy to say, yeah, you actually have Lyme disease because you have all the symptoms. Uh, at the same token, I looked at her and said, you know, well, you don't remember a bite and you've had chronic constipation your whole life. You got bloating. You, you feel like you always feel pregnant. So we ran, a, we, we ran a test on her, a breath test to see if she had that SIBO activity. And we preemptively just put her on a paleo diet. Uh, mm -hmm. And lo and behold, on the paleo diet, she actually resolved her symptoms just on the paleo diet. And I told her, hey, good news, bad news, uh, your test was positive. You have, you're symptom-free on the diet, but guess what? The problem's still there. So we're going to treat it and cause your symptoms probably to reoccur during the die-off phase, but you'll be better at the end. And that's what happened. Another example was a gentleman who had Lyme disease. Uh, and with Lyme disease, uh, he was treated. Uh, he was treated uh, uh, effectively and quickly. Afterwards, he still had symptoms, symptoms of migrating joint pain, muscle fatigue, uh, and, and some uh, uh, muscle spasming. So he associated that with the Lyme disease because it didn't happen until Lyme occurred and was one of the symptoms that he noticed really predominantly throughout the, the, the infection. Well, uh, he said, you know, it, it all went away on, on the antibiotics. And then two months later, three months later, it just started creeping back. Well, that's commonly what we hear from people. And at the same, and many people will say, well, your chronic Lyme came back. Well, yes and no. I mean, maybe it did. It's possible it wasn't fully treated. Or 
maybe the doxycycline uh, that you took uh, uh, aggravated or caused a intestinal dysbiosis, which then led to the uh, uh, symptoms uh, coming back with this extra inflammation and immune activity. Well, lo and behold, you know, in this particular case, he tested, he was positive, he was treated, all symptoms went away. It wasn't Lyme disease, it was a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And, and one other patient that we had, a uh, gentleman, he had uh, a lower back pain for 18 years, and this was uh, horribly debilitating for him. Uh, he, as he mentioned, it was lower back pain uh, in the very lower back, just always preventing him from doing things, and a pelvic pain that just felt like a knife stabbing him. And he'd been to everyone and everything and been told that he had all these different infections, tried different things. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, he, he ended up testing rather positive on a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth test. Uh, we went through uh, a couple rounds of antibiotics and botanical herbs. All of his lower back pain completely went away. All of it. Unbelievable. And this is a person who had surgical consults and, and of course, they're scr everyone's scratching their heads like, well, we don't know what's wrong. And, and of course, it's that referred pain. You, in the intestines, if you have that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in the intestine, it could refer to all the areas from the lower back to the middle back and to all the organs around that. Uh, and so it, it's definitely something to look into. Wow. Wow. Dr. Bush, I feel like I, we need double the time today, but I want to be respectful for where we're at because you're on the floor in 30 minutes to save, continue to save lives. So before we go, I think there's going to be a lot of listeners that wonder how to find you. Um, how, if they have questions, like where would they go? I know that you have an online, online opportunity or online clinic. Could you expand on that so that for those that are listening know how to reach out to you? Sure. Well, our clinic is uh, Natural Medicine in Stillwater in beautiful Stillwater, Minnesota, the birthplace of Minnesota. Thank you very much. Um, and our clinic uh, website, you can come take a, take a look at it. It's www.stillwaternatural.com. And uh, um, check us out there. Now, I have, uh, I, I, I've, I, lecture around the country, I write articles, and people find me, uh, and so I have patients all around the country, and around the world, so we also have, we've just set up an online uh, extension of our clinic. Now, many people, they have good healthcare practitioners that they're working with, but they're looking for someone who's more of an expert in certain tests. And with our ability, uh, one of my specialties have always been neuroadrenal and neurotransmitter testing and the small, that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth testing. And so we have an online clinic uh, site called www.neurovana, that's N-E-U-R-O-V-A-N-N-A, neurovana.com. And that is a site that you can order uh, uh, urinary neurotransmitter testing, uh, neuroadrenal uh, testing, uh, both urine and saliva, and you could order glucose uh, breath uh, testing. And those three are available, uh, which you can just uh, uh, order, and then you'll get your test results. You'll get a small interpretation of, and some recommendations on how to address that. And likewise, especially if you are working with a good practitioner in your area, uh, the, using that information with their skill sets is usually a great winning scenario. We, uh, we do take patients long distance also uh, if you want to be a formal patient. And once again, you can check our website out at stillwaternatural.com. And what is your free offer for the listeners? The free offer that we're offering for anyone as part of the summit is a 20% coupon for any of the testing th uh, offered through our online Neurovana store. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Before we go, I just have two fun questions. I'm one of those type of people that I always wonder what's in other people's refrigerators. Mm -hmm. So if I came to your home today and opened up your refrigerator, what are two things I would always find? Always find. Uh, you'll always find cauliflower and broccoli. <laughs> those, are, those are always uh, 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 in large quantities. Um, more exciting, um, uh, you'll find spinach. Um, you'll find the kids always have coconut yogurt. 
Um, so those are, those, are the, those are some staples. It's a little boring in that regard. Um, <laughs> that's okay. That, that's, sometimes the boring stuff leads to great health. If you were <laughs> stuck on an island and all you could bring is two products or supplements, and one of my prior interviews said, can I have electricity? And I said, okay, electricity. What two products or supplements would you take on to a deserted island? So you're probably, you're talking about nutritional supplements, I'm going to yes. say. So, yeah. uh, cause my, 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 my Apple computer and a solar, uh, <laughs> so that's, uh, so, so, um, my two things that I would probably take with me, um, I'm a big fan of, uh, uh Candibactin AR from Metagenics. Yes. Uh, it's a gel capsule, the essential oils, um, that just makes your tummy very happy. And if I'm on the desert island, I, I'm going to have, I'm going to have to go with sunscreen. Um, so I mean, it just, just because of locale. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Bush. This has been so valuable, not only to me, but to our listeners. And I want to make sure that I remind everybody to watch their inboxes every single morning because we've got more experts coming your way. I don't want you to miss it. We are truly on a mission to help others feel hope, find answers, and to start healing. We want to help you work out of those autoimmune disorders, chronic pain, um, and even fatigue. So we'll see you tomorrow on our next episode of the Take Your Life Back Summit. This is Dr. Heather Yost. Take care and be well.